Once, a couple of thousand years ago, the colorful Roman legions marched upon the earth. What was the life like for ordinary soldiers serving the emperor? No analysis, charts, or heavy historical data. In the next couple of minutes, let's delve into the everyday life, salary, and entertainment of an ordinary Roman legionary. Let's say our guy's name is Quadratus. Interestingly, during that time, such a name did exist, and it can indeed be found quite frequently on Roman tombstones. If we're being more precise, we're talking about a nickname because Roman citizens had very colorful names. They consisted of three parts, the praenomen, given name, nomen, family name, and cognomen, nickname. Among the Romans, it is precisely the cognomen, nickname, that can be called their true unique name. For example, Emperor Gaius Julius Caesar is a true enigma. Gaius is a personal name, Julius is the family name, and Caesar is the nickname, the meaning of which scholars have yet to fully decipher to this day. Some believe that it was used to refer to those with a full head of hair, while others claim that Caesar translated to divine, or in ancient Rome there was such a salad, but that's not the point. The bottom line is that the boys got their name from their father, that is, Emperor Caesar's father was also called Gaius Julius Caesar. In order to somehow distinguish sons from fathers, nicknames were used, senior, junior, or just ordinal numbers. It's even funnier with girls. At birth, their father's last name became their first name, and they most often received their last name from their husband. For example, the daughter of Gaius Julius Caesar was named Julia, and after her marriage to Gnaeus Pompey, the great, she became Julia Pompey. Meanwhile, if there were many boys in the family, one of them took a second or even a third nickname. As a result, by the end of the Roman Empire, there were people with five names at once. Even the famous Caligula was actually also called Gaius Julius Caesar. And in order not to confuse him with his famous ancestor, the slaughtered Brutus, historians use only a nickname in textbooks. But our mercenary is a simple soldier, so he has an ordinary name. Let's suppose Lucius Cincius Quadratus. One of our ancestors was the legendary Lucius Cincius Alimentus, who fought against Hannibal. Even after 300 years, we continue to bear his name. And the only unique thing we have is the nickname Quadratus, the origin of which is also shrouded in mystery. Maybe he liked to eat too much. So, in the year 15 of our era, the Roman Empire is strong as ever. It extends from northern France to the middle of Africa, holding dominion over all. And the credit for that goes to the mighty army of legionnaires, among whom our Quadratus is one. By the way, the name Lucius could only be called by our relatives. Mostly people who were not particularly familiar used surnames or nicknames. So most often our mercenary was called Cincius or Quadratus. The father of our hero, like the overwhelming majority of legionnaires' parents, was an ordinary, not wealthy farmer. Therefore, as soon as Quadratus turned 18, he enlisted in the army. Although it was essentially mandatory, the conditions at that time were excellent. Not long ago, Emperor Gaius Julius Caesar increased the salary of legionnaires to 900 sesterces per year. That's approximately equivalent to nine gold coins, and an additional three coins are given as a bonus for signing a service contract. Historical data from the excavations of Pompeii says that a person could easily live on two sesterces per day. This is understandable because for one sesterce you could buy as many as four plates of soup. If anyone is interested, a very rough exchange rate for modern money gives two euros for one sesterce. For example, in the year 15 of our era, our Quadratus could buy a liter of wine for exactly two euros, and if he wanted a mule, it would cost him around a thousand. Indeed, they are quite fitting analogies to reality, aren't they? However, the term of service in the army was terrifying for as long as 20 years. Before our era, at times it could be as short as six years, but later in the life of our Quadratus, closer to the end of the first century, it could extend to the full 26 years. The good news is that there was no easy life even outside of military service, especially for poor workers who toiled for 14 hours a day. So the fate of a legionnaire wasn't all that bad. As upon completion of service, they were granted a discharge bonus of 12,000 sesterces and sometimes even received sizable parcels of land. There are many stories of deceit, non-payment, 
and the appropriation of lifeless territories as a reward for service to former legionnaires. But our Quadratus is a good mercenary, and misfortune will pass him by. Indeed, that will only happen after 20 years. In the meantime, legendary four months of training for recruits lie ahead. In the treatise De Re Militari by Vegetius, there is a simple but truthful phrase. The fact that the Romans were able to conquer the entire world can only be explained by their military training, camp discipline, and military practice, says Vegetius. And he is absolutely right. Unlike later formations, legionnaires were like machines. After grueling training, our Quadratus learned to march 35 kilometers in five hours at a fast pace, carrying 20 kilograms of equipment. Along the way, he also mastered the intricate system of commands given by horns and banners. Roman generals believed that maintaining formation was the key to victory. Considering the results of Rome's wars, it is difficult to argue with them. During the training of a young soldier, everything was practiced. Formation in the testudo, tortoise, square, wedge formation, combat with wooden swords and archery. Quadratus will leave this place as a perfect killing machine, and what is equally important, capable of anything. Not every modern army can boast such care for its soldiers. After all, legionnaires were taught to swim while fully equipped, so as not to accidentally drown during river crossings. The health of a legionnaire was of utmost importance, and any food that came to our little quadratus was checked by all possible services. Even water was carefully examined by officers to ensure that the military wouldn't be poisoned. And if something went wrong or a wound was sustained in battle in ancient Rome, for the first time in modern history, there were specialized medical units, sanitarii, that existed to provide medical assistance to wounded soldiers. In every legion there were medics, infirmaries were established, and a sick or injured soldier would receive the necessary assistance. The inscription of an order from one of the legion commanders has survived to the present day, and it states that during the assault on a city, the camp should be set up several kilometers away from the besieged area. Why? So that the wounded wouldn't hear the noise of the battle and could regain their strength in peace. Attention was also given to another important detail the fighting spirit. There were no communal mess halls and no sense of slavery. Roman legionnaires were divided into centuries, and more importantly, contubernia. And this was a small squad of eight people who carried everything together. The Romans had the idea that this group of eight would do everything together, from sharing meals to spending evenings together. When going to war, these soldiers fought primarily not for the emperor, but for their contubernium for their friends and comrades. Moreover, not only was this not prohibited, but it was also encouraged from above. The soldiers' priority was first the lives of their comrades, then the prestige of their century of a hundred men, and only after that the status of the legion consisting of 60 centuries. The Romans revolutionized warfare because on the battlefield, side by side, they were not strangers to each other, but comrades who had lived together for years. Many graves from that time bear the mention of the word brother, demonstrating how deep the bonds between soldiers went. However, there were similarities to the modern army. Not all legions were constantly engaged in warfare. Our quadratus could very well serve as police or construction workers somewhere for an entire year. There are known cases where legionaries collected taxes or worked as guards. During peacetime, the legion would gather once a year for the Natalis Aquilae, also known as the birthday celebration. The celebration included feasts, demonstrative drills, and various festivities aimed at maintaining high morale. Although the Roman army's fighting spirit was not always at its peak, it played a significant role in Rome's conquest of half the world. Even during campaigns, legionaries had plenty to keep themselves occupied, and gambling thrived like never before. The guys played dice, heads or tails, which was called head or ship, and even a more complex version of tic-tac-toe called mill wheel, where the goal was to place three tokens in a row to win on the field. The most passionate ones invented a prototype of modern backgammon called tabula, in which entire fortunes were gambled away. It got to the point where tabula was banned at the legislative level, but resourceful soldiers found ways to play. We can only hope that our quadratus is not prone to gambling addiction.
On average, only 60% of legionaries in the empire lived to retirement. However, it is important not to forget that this figure is significantly skewed by the front-line zones, where legions could lose up to half of their soldiers in a single day. It is also not worth paying attention to another prejudice. Even in textbooks, you can come across the phrase that life expectancy in ancient times was 30 years, and a 60-year-old was considered something extraordinary. This is a blatant lie, and the blame lies with the infant mortality rate. With the invention of antibiotics, infant mortality rates swiftly decreased, leading to a significant increase in average life expectancy. Indeed, if you take an 80-year-old elderly person and a 1-year-old child who died from an illness, on average, they each lived for 40 years. That is precisely how the low life expectancy figures of ancient times are derived. However, modern scientists clearly state that if a person in ancient Rome reached adulthood, their chances of living a happy old age were not significantly lower than ours. So, if our old friend Quadratus survived 20 years in the army, he had a chance to reach the age of 40, marry a beautiful wife, and live peacefully on a farm provided by the state or purchased with his accumulated savings and retirement funds. Yes, the life of a legionary cannot be called easy. But can anyone truly claim that their own life is easy? One thing we can say with certainty is that in ancient Rome, soldiers were not considered disposable. Continuous work was done to maintain discipline, improve combat skills, and enhance physical fitness. The quality of food was closely monitored, and there were medics ready to assist soldiers even on the battlefield. Various things naturally occurred. Sometimes entire centuries would desert, and some legionaries would go mad. But this is more of an exception to the rule, because at its peak of power, the Roman army was an organization comparable to modern states in terms of its organization and efficiency. And our friend Quadratus believed that he was living a good life and fighting for something great, especially since a legitimate rest and decent bonuses from the state awaited him ahead. If you want to learn more about the ancient world, don't hesitate to leave a like and write about it in the comments. Until we meet again, friends.